Friday the 13th. And guess what? I just finished watching Friday the 13th Part 1 and Part 2. Since to me they both seem to take place within the same time, this review is going to be a review of both those parts. Now, Friday the 13th Part 1. It is still a cult classic horror movie. You know, it's the first time, you know, in my understanding, that a female was a killer in the film, Mrs. Voorhees. And before I go further, even though the movie's a few years old, spoiler alert. Just so nobody gives me any, uh, anger issues. Now, beginning of the movie, there's a girl named Annie who is trucking through, you know, a town and is trying to find directions on how to get to Camp Crystal Lake. She gets, you know, she goes into, like, a diner, asks them about it, they tell her where it's located and everything, and a guy offers to give her a lift halfway. As they're leaving the place, they meet the old man who is the crazy loon that everybody doesn't believe and thinks is just nuts, trying to tell her that she's going to die. Do not go. Ralph, I think is his name. He's the old, he's an old man and he's crazy, and he tries to warn her she won't listen. Now, the beginning of the movie, I like how with, the same with Nightmare on Elm Street Part 1, they take him try to trick you into thinking who the heroine is of the movie. You think it's this Annie girl, but then she bites it like 20 minutes, like the first 15 minutes into the film. Then you get to the camp where all these new teenagers are going to Camp Crystal Lake because they're going to be camp counselors, and it's a few days before the kids are alive, so they're going to get all set up and everything. The actual protagonist, Alice, is, you know an artist and everything and she actually wants to leave the camp because she doesn't like what her ex-boyfriend is doing but he convinces her to stay now people start dying however I like how the fact of one you can't really tell it's a girl I mean you see like a freaking flannel hunter jacket you see jeans and work boots so you can't really tell it's a man or a female. And also, too, most of it is through the POV of the killer. You don't really fully see the killer. You see what the killer's doing. There's a couple scenes with, you know, Mrs. Voorhees where you can see a huge ring on the hand, and that's it. But some guys do wear rings like that, you know. But there's a couple of hints here and there when she's talking to Anne in the car when she's getting a ride. Um... Anne's talking about how she's always wanted to work with kids and she can't wait to have her own grandchildren and everything. Usually that's a conversation you would have with another female. But also, too, you should never get into a fucking car with a complete stranger you don't fucking know. Anyways, people start dying, but they're disappearing and nobody's really seeming to notice. Some, you know, one person disappears and they're like, oh, he's just a goofball and go. Two other people disappear and, well, they're having sex, so it doesn't matter. So people were dying, but no one's seeing any dead bodies, so they're not completely freaking until the last two or two people are left, you know, and the other guy, he bites it. Finally, by the time everyone is dead but Alice, she finally sees a dead body and starts freaking out and wondering what the hell's going on. That's when Mrs. Voorhees finally decides to introduce herself for some odd reason and, you know, tries to convince the girl we need to leave. However, you know, not knowing that she's gone all fucking crazy because her son died while two council counselors were having sex. Now, while the killer's chasing her and everything, Alice is pretty smart. She decides to go back to a cabin. She There's no lock, so she ties a rope to it and everything and puts stuff in front of the door. She grabs a baseball bat. But then she goes into the kitchen, and instead of grabbing a knife, she grabs a barbecue fork. A barbecue fork. That right there took all of her smart credibility and it went down. But once she finds out who it is, this missing voice, she starts chasing her. She goes back into that same cabin and turns off all the lights and hides into, you know, the closet where all the food is. Now, what would have been the smarter thing there would have been to take and leave the lights on and then hide. Because if you turn off the lights, someone's going to wonder if you're in there. Well, this woman, Alice, she hits Mrs. Voorhees the three times and knocks her out. And each time she knocks her out, she doesn't keep hitting her. She just, you know, thinks that, okay, it's done and leaves. By the third time of hitting her with a cast iron pan, you should have smacked her over the head about four more times to make sure. 
She ends up going to where a canoe is by the lake. Mrs. Voorhees appears, seeing her reflection through the water. They have a nice little scuffle until Alice breaks free and grabs the machete. Now, Alice is a good foot or two away, and Miss Voorhees, even though she's the bad guy, just stands there with a shocked look on her face until her head gets cut off. She had plenty of time to move out of the way, but I get it, she's the villain, she needs to die. Then she, Alice gets on the canoe and leaves, you know, that, okay, cool. And then all of a sudden, as she sees a cop, she gets grabbed by Jason out of the lake and yanked down, and you're like, oh my god, what's going on? But then they totally fucking ruin that when she wakes up in the hospital. It was all a dream she had. It never happened. You know, she asks him about the boy and everything, and there was no boy. We never found a boy. Then he's still out there. Which is okay, but I would have liked the ending of the cliffhanger of she's yanked down the water. Does she live? Does she not? What's going on? But... No, they, you know, decide not to go off the cliffhanger, which to me would have been the better choice. You know. So, my final verdict for Friday the 13th Part 1 is a 9.5 out of 10. It is a more phenomenal movie. It is fantastic. It is a great classic horror movie with a mother who's gone crazy about her son dying and even has her son talking to her, which is her talking to herself, to killing people. All to stop them from reopening the camp. She's just gone psycho. It's a really good movie. You know, some of the deaths and everything you can tell it's fake, some of the special effects are outdated, but it's still a good funny movie to sit down and enjoy with your family, a popcorn flick, make comments about how stupid the actors are being and everything, but it's very very entertaining and I really suggest that you guys watch it. Friday the 13th part 2. Now for some reason uh, you know the filmmakers thought it was pretty smart to uh, show us Ah, excuse me. <laughs> now, they thought it would be a nifty idea to have Alice, the survivor from the first one, sleeping in a bed and having a dream and showing previous scenes of the previous film of what happened to give us a little bit of a, a recap, right? She gets up. Now, normally people would wake the fuck up from a nightmare with being dragged by a weird fucking kid and getting yanked on the water. No, she wakes up after... After the end of the first movie happens, he's still there, and it shows like, then she wakes up terrified. Okay? So she gets up, gets a little water on her face, dries off, calls her mom. Her mom calls. She tells her mom she wants to get her life back together. It's only been two months since the, you know, attack on the camp. Decides to set up some tea, and a cat jumps in, gives us a cheap scare. The cat wants fed. She goes into the fridge to get the fat cat food, and Mrs. Voorhees' his head is there. She freaks out, and all of a sudden, some guy takes an ice pick and stabs it through her head and kills her. Now, we all know, of course, again, spoiler alert, that it's Jason. But, after that, the title screen pops up and everything, and then we learn that there's another group of kids who are going to a camp, but they're not going to Camp Crystal Lake. They're going to a different camp that's, like, you know, in the neighboring area of the first camp you know, of Cap Crystal Lake, with a new guy and everything, and there's a lot of people there, a lot of people who are going to be campers, you know, and the main heroine this time who shows up, oh, she had car troubles, and she's also a psych major, so she uses some psychobabble on her boyfriend to get him not to be mad at her. Now, the first day, everything's not too bad, um, Muffy, which is a little girl's dog, ends up, you know, disappearing, and you think it's going to get killed because it's staring right at Jason. And then, and another thing too, with even though we know it's Jason, when you first watch it, you don't know if it's Jason or not. Because once again, you don't get to see a full body. You get to see most of it through the killer's eyes, the POV of the killer's eyes. I really like that. I really think that is, that's a really good idea and a very smart thing to do. This time, however, half of the people, you know... After two of the counselors decide to trespass on Camp Blood because the woman wants to go there and she convinces the boy, they get brought back by cops. They decide to, after the you know the guy who runs the camp, let them have a fun day. They get to have a fun night, and then the real work starts tomorrow. So they all 
a lot of them go out to go get some drinks, have some beers, and some of them stay. Now, I'm sorry, but it, it, it's just common sense that these campers end up staying at the camp are gonna die. Even some random cop who decides to go chasing after Jason in the woods finds a hidden camp area where his mom is and gets himself a hammer to the head. Now, of course, half the freaking campers that stayed at the camp stayed because they want to have sex. They're going to bone each other. Even the one girl who was hot for the guy in the wheelchair uses a game to try to hint to the fact that she wants to get some. Now, normally you would think the couple that goes to have sex would be the first to bite it. But no, actually, you know, a girl decides to go skinny dipping and her boyfriend decides to play a trick on her and take her clothes until he gets hit by, you know, a trap that hangs him upside down. She goes to get a knife to help him, and he gets his slit throat. Now, you don't actually see her die, but after she sees his dead body, she goes screaming and running. Now, after that, of course, you got the two who end up going upstairs having sex, and the guy in the wheelchair basically tells the other girl, hey, I'm ready to go. So she goes back to her captain to get all ready and everything, and he stays there. He goes outside after a little bit and in true horror movie fashion calls out her name. Just calls out her name. And then he gets a machete to the face and drop down a flight of stairs. Now, I do like this and no, don't get me wrong, you know, I don't I think it's not cool that people are in wheelchairs, but the fact that they are willing to kill a handicapped person in the movie means that they're not afraid of boundaries and the guy's not just gonna live because he's handicapped, you know, he's just like any other person. He's free game. After he does that, he takes a spear and goes kills the other two upstairs by stabbing them both through. And that that was awesome, in my opinion. At this point in the movie, though, you actually see Jason. There's no more of the POV through his eyes, which I wish might have stayed around a little bit longer. Because to me, I thought that was pretty cool. Now, after that, uh, the main heroine and her boyfriend come back from having beers and everything. And... You know, they wonder where everyone's gone and everything and until she goes upstairs and finds a, you know, a bed full of blood. And there's one thing I do have to point out. Both of them were out drinking. They had a couple of beers, but yet they're still, you know, very inebriate, you know, you know, um, focused and everything so that they can handle themselves against this killer. After that, she they're standing in the fucking um, living room and I swear to God, this is the weirdest thing ever. She's looking around, it's dark, and she's like, Paul, there's somebody in here. And Paul turns around. And instead of saying, Paul, fucking behind you, she says, there's somebody fucking in here. Instead of saying behind you, when she saw the guy, they get into a scuffle, and then he, she goes, Ch Jason goes chasing after her. She's smart enough to try to go to her car and start it, but in true horror movie fashion, it doesn't start. So he attacks her. She gets out of the car, tries to hide behind a bush, that doesn't work. She tries to go to a different car, she can't get in, so she tricks him by going around the car while he walks the other way. She gets to another cabin and hides under the bed. Jason walks in, he looks around, doesn't find her, but a mouse, a rat, crawls under the bed and she pisses herself. Now, she's laying on the ground, so honestly, how did he hear her piss herself? I guess coming back to life gives you super great hearing like Daredevil or something. So he tries to trick her by going out the door and coming back. He's standing on an itty bitty little chair. She comes out. He tries to kill her, but he falls. She ends up running away all the way to the cabin that he built at Crystal Lake for a shrine of his mother. Now she's a kid's psych major, so the best idea she has is to put on the sweater, hide behind the head, and tries to convince Jason that she is his mother. And it works. It really works. He almost doesn't fall for it, but, you know, she raises her voice and everything. And she's about to deliver a killing blow, and she moved too far and shows the head. And then he knows it's all wrong, and he hits her with the pickaxe and gets her cut a little bit. You know, then all of a sudden, Paul shows back up. You know, and, uh, you know, I guess he just got knocked out. Jason didn't kill him. They fight. As he's fighting with Jason, she stabs him with the machete right here and cuts his clavicle. Paul picks her up, carries her back to her cabin. You know, they're all like, oh, finally, yeah, it's all over and everything. Something happens, the door starts twisting, and she's... So he grabs the broken pitchfork, hands it to her. He takes the other end, stands by the door, opens it. It's Muffin, the dog. The dog wasn't dead. The dog's okay. 
And then all of a sudden, Jason bursts through the window and grabs her. And shakes her for a few seconds. She screams for a few seconds. Then it, sh you know, fades black, comes back out. And she's being yanked out by the ambulance and put in an ambulance asking where Paul is. The door shut. It drives away. And that's it. We don't get to find out what happened to Paul, and all we know is she's in an ambulance being drove away. And I forgot to mention, too, the tra the town crazy Ralph. He ends up getting killed. He's actually the first person to get killed by uh, Jason. He gets choked. And Jason also, too, loves to set up bodies in different places to hang and pop out of just because he knows sure as shit that this girl he's going after is going to open the door and reveal this dead body. So you don't get to find out what happened to Paul. And there's no big cliffhanger or false cliffhanger in this one. You know, but it, it, it's still a good popcorn flick. My final verdict for Friday the 13th Part 2 is, I know, um, I'm going to actually go for 9.7 on this one. 9.7 out of 10. This is also a more phenomenal film. In my opinion, it actually is better than the first one, even though the first one is very iconic. But this is another great movie film. The special effects look actually a little bit better. They still hold up to today, other like the first one. This one, they actually still look good, even though you know that it's a very old film. The fact of it being Jason as the killer brings in some of the supernatural, the fact he's supposed to be dead, but he's doing this for his mom. I actually might have wanted to like to see maybe the mom come back or something, because I thought that would be cool, because a female killer would be... That'd be pretty nice, in my opinion, but, you know, they didn't go with that. Also, nifty to note that Jason does not have his traditional hockey mask on right now. Right now, he just has a bag over his head. He doesn't get the hockey mask until 3, I believe, part 3. I'm not sure. I think it's part 3. I haven't watched the movies, but, hey, I'll be watching the yeah, part 3 tomorrow, and then the review will be up, so, you know, you'll know by then. But, yeah. 9.7 is a good movie. It is better than the first one and everything, but it's still very entertaining. You still love yelling at the screen because the characters are stupid and everything. You know, and Jason, he's at this point right now where he doesn't take a lot. He took a smack to the clavicle, and that was about it, and he, he's down, you know. I still would like to know what happened to Paul, but I think that gets answered in the third one, because if I'm not mistaken, the heroine in this one, like in this one, Alice died. She gets killed in the third one, and they get a new heroine. But yeah, that's it. Go ahead and leave me a comment down below. You know, are you superstitious on Friday the 13th? Do you think part 2 is better than part 1? Like this video and share it with your friends. Maybe they agree with my opinion, maybe they don't. And subscribe up to the channel or down here to subscribe to the channel. Promise it's totally free. You can see more of these Friday the 13th views as they're posted. And you can also see more... Um, reviews, trailer reviews, movie reviews, and everything, and everything else that I'm working on into the near future. Thanks for watching, and have a more phenomenal day.